This morning is temptations. Temptations. Need to go back and look at a little verse we talked about uh, several weeks ago. It's in chapter 2, verse 15. It's kind of clearing up things here. Uh, it says, And was there until the death of Herod, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Out of Egypt did I call my son. Now I need to clarify something here, folks, because this might be a misprint or something, but uh, uh, this verse that he's quoting from Hosea 11.1 1 has really nothing to do with the messianic prophecy directly. I, I need to read to you Hosea 11.1. 1. Here's what it actually says. Matthew must have got it wrong. Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. So you see Matthew apparently is misquoting Hosea 11.1 1, because Hosea 11.1 1 has nothing to do with Messiah. It has to do with, with Israel being called out of Egypt, not the Messiah at all. In fact, he goes on and he says, The more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I t- took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. So see, the original context that Matthew must be misquoting uh, actually is talking about Israel, how he called them out of Egypt and took them into the wilderness, and, and how they uh, failed temptation and they fell into idolatry. So Matthew must have got it wrong, the experts say, right? Matthew must have been incredibly ignorant of the Old Testament because he's obviously misquoting it as a messianic prophecy when it really has to do with Israel out of Egypt, I have called my son. That's what scholars would have us to believe. Uh, The the experts who know, uh, they are the ones who have told us, uh, hath God said, surely not, we find a mistake in the Gospel of Matthew. Anybody ready to throw away their Bibles at this point? Found a a mistake in the Gospel of of Matthew. Obviously, he doesn't know how to quote Scripture, and he's quoting it, misquoting it to a bunch of illiterates who don't understand what they're reading, because if they knew, they would know this is not a messianic prophecy. This is actually uh, talking about Israel in a historical reference. Nobody's ready to throw away their Bibles? Well, good. Because what I'm doing obviously, as an opening to the sermon, is I'm just uh, reliving, I guess you could call it devil's advocate. The first temptation in the garden begins with what? Hath God said? Has God spoken? Now, what this is actually doing, what, what Matthew is actually doing here, is he's speaking to a very biblically literate audience. And he's making an allusion to Hosea 11.1. And what he's doing is he's setting them up for what's to come next. See, after chapter 2 is the baptism, and after chapter 3 is the temptation in the wilderness. He wants their mind to be brought back to the fact that Israel was brought out of Egypt into the wilderness to be tempted. And what happened in that wilderness? They failed. And where Israel fails, Christ prevails. This is part of the context for Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It's part of the context of the baptism. Because in the baptism, what did we see? We saw the impeccability of Christ. Everyone else is coming and confessing their sins and being baptized, saying, I am in need of cleansing. But when Jesus shows up to do the same thing, what does the Father say? Does He say, this is my Son, I forgive you? No. He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The endorsement of the Father is given to the Son. My Son has been perfect up to this point. My Son has fleed youthful lusts. Now, we call this the temptation of Christ as we come to chapter 4. You may turn there. We call this the temptation of Christ. But just a little reminder, this is not the first temptation of Christ, nor is it the last. He's already lived 30 years. He's been fleeing youthful lusts 
for 30 years. I want you to think about how remarkable that is. Jesus, born under the law, had to be tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He had to deal with hormones. He's already been tested by girls that wanted to attract the eye and have people worship them with lust. He's already had that thrown at him. What did he say? Well, we're not given the record of that, but I imagine he said something like that. Get thee behind me, Satan. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? He's already been tempted with the temptation to dishonor legitimate authority. He's already had his parents tell him to do things that to his intellect wouldn't have made sense, and they probably didn't. And yet he had to honor his mother and father and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. He's already been tempted with friends coming along or people coming along and saying, Hey, Jesus, let's go do this. When he knew it was the wrong thing to do. And he had to say, Get thee behind me, Satan. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. He has faced youthful lusts. He has faced uh, the the temptations of pride, uh, the desires of the body, the desires of the mind, the desire for the appreciation of peers. He's faced all of that, and never once did he give in. He never backslid. He never frontslid. He never had a self-righteous attitude. He was never arrogant or condescending. He never mocked other people and put them down to make himself feel a little bit bigger. Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So when he comes to the baptism and John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He's up to this point, a flawless Lamb without blemish, unscathed by everything that the body and the appetites and the desires of men could throw at Him. And so, when Matthew quotes this scripture in chapter 2 to a very biblically literate audience who knows how to read Hebrew and knows how to speak Greek, he's quoting it to the, 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 Matthew's quoting it to them. He's drawing to their attention that a pattern is being played out here in the early chapters of Matthew. We have the flawless Christ early in Matthew set out for us. And by the end of the book, we see that flawless Christ being nailed to a cross, buried in a tomb, and rising again triumphant, fit to be a priest at the right hand of the Father and pray for us who do not come out of temptations unscathed. So the point of the sermon this morning, first of all, we see in Jesus the second Adam and the true Israel of God where they failed, He prevailed, and He is fit to be the Lamb that takes away your sin and my sin, nails it to the cross, and gives us the gift of righteousness so that we can boldly come to the throne of God without fear of the earth swallowing us up like Korah and those in rebellion. That is the reason why Matthew quotes this scripture was for them to see the pattern fulfilled more than the prophecy fulfilled. It's a pattern that is being played out here. We see, first of all, let's read. Let's go ahead and go to chapter 4 now. This is right after the baptism. We just heard last week about how the Spirit of God, uh, just as in the Old Testament, uh, He came upon Balaam, He left Balaam. He came upon Saul, He left Saul. He came upon Samson, He left Samson. He came upon uh, Gideon and Jephthah and Barak, He left them. But when He came upon Jesus, the dove rested, never to leave again. When the dove found the perfect resting place for the sole of her foot, she did not return unto Noah. And when the Holy Spirit found the perfect, flawless, human being he ascended descended and remained upon him without measure the sinless christ now that's the end of chapter three but no need for chapter divisions we keep reading and we're still talking about the holy spirit the spirit of holiness the spirit that dwells upon him without measure as we come in to chapter four let's look at four Uh, 
and we're going to uh, we're going to start in in verse one here. Oh boy, I'm in the wrong book. Matthew chapter four. Acts 4 won't do, so don't go there. (laughs) Do as I say, not as I do. (laughs) Uh, Actually applicable. Uh, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Okay, first of all, I want to compare the second Adam with the first. Paul calls... Jesus, the second Adam. Because you're in an Adam one way or the other. You are either in Father Adam, who sinned and brought the death and curse as our federal head, to borrow a theological term. He was our federal, our covenantal head. When he chose to disobey God and partake of that which was forbidden, we were all in him. We were in his loins. We were in his body. And if we had been there, we would have done the same thing because we did. The old... uh, uh, Puritan uh, reader, blue black speller. A is for Adam, and Adam's fall, we send all. That's the way Puritan children learn to read. A is for Adam, and Adam's fall, we send all. When Adam sinned, we sinned, and our sin nature was given to us, that inclination, uh, just like he, when he represented us, we send in Adam. We are either in Adam, or Paul says, we are in the second Adam. And so we have a comparison here of Adam versus Jesus. Now, where was Adam and Eve tempted? In the garden. Where is Jesus tempted? In the wilderness. What a comparison. Adam is full. Jesus is and hungered. Adam has abundance and Jesus has nothing. Adam has been eating and dining and enjoying all the trees of the garden he can freely eat. He has every provision. There's no ailment in his body. He doesn't have a sin nature. Uh, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have any reason to disobey God. God has given him everything that he needs. And in this superabundance, he fails. But in the wilderness, while he's hungered, Jesus prevails. There's a contrast here. Christ is so far superior Both are called the Son of God. Adam is called the Son of God in Luke. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Adam, by creation, uh, Jesus is the eternally begotten Son. We say eternally begotten. He's begotten, not made. Describing his position as the second person of the Trinity. Not that he had a start in time, but in his relationship to the Father. It's a description not of of, of creation, but of of his, his relationship with the Father as a distinct person in the Trinity. But here he is, the Son of God versus the Son of God, Adam. And Adam fails, and Christ prevails. Adam is, has abundance, Jesus is hungry. And we have this little thing here. I want to go back there, and I want to look at this. You don't have to turn there. Um, I'll just read it to you. And I, I presume it's a, a familiar scripture with you, most of you anyway. Genesis 3.1 Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. And don't you forget it which the Lord God hath made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said. What's he doing? He's questioning the word of God. I began the sermon, tongue firmly planted in cheek, questioning the word of God, because this is Satan's favorite tactic that he's still using to this day. Undermine the scriptures, you undermine everything. Get rid of Genesis chapter 1, you undermine everything. If you can't believe Genesis chapter 1, you can't believe any of it. If God was not able to, to speak it, uh, then, and He wasn't able to, prov- to preserve it, He wasn't able to speak it to begin with. So Satan loves to cast doubt on the Word of God. And this is Satan's favorite tactic from the beginning. Hath God said, You shall not eat from every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. Notice, there is a very clear word from God of what they are to do. And I want to tell you, Jesus knew very firmly that the Spirit led him into the wilderness to fast, not to dine on stones made into bread. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. 
For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Hebrew idiom for you shall be as God's declaring for yourselves what is good and evil. You will get to make the rules. You get to be in the driver's seat. You get to ascend unto the place of the Most High and be the author of your own destiny. Same lie repackaged over and over and over again throughout history. Now what was going on inside the woman? What was she thinking? Well, it tells us. The sovereign inspired Holy Writ tells us. When the woman saw that the tree was, number one, good for food. It was appealing to the God-given appetite for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes. It was purdy. It was pretty. It was desirable to look at. It was artistic. It had beautiful form, beautiful symmetry, something desirable. Did it sparkle like gold or diamonds? I don't know. But it was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. It was an education in a bite. Better than sending away a thousand dollars for a a, a, a paper on the wall that says, Doctor, all she had to do was bite of the fruit, instantly educated, instantly knowing good and evil, like unto God, you get to declare your own destiny, desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her. He ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. What we see is the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Here's a Satan's tactic right here. Number one, Satan knows how you work. He knows your appetites, your God-given appetites. And these are God-given appetites. These are good appetites. Is desire for a food a good thing? Well, yes, God designed us to like food. Is it, is it desirable? Is it okay to think something is pretty? God, it, Yes, God loves beauty. Look at the world that he created. You know, he didn't even have to give us eyes that comprehend all this beauty. Now, there's a lot of creatures, they see maybe black and white, or they, they have sonar, they see depth in some kind of way, like sharks and different creatures. Uh, they can see in the dark, but they don't see much beauty. But when he gave man an eye, when he gave you an eye, he gave you the ability to, to, to see texture and color and to distinguish all the different aspects of beauty. And he gave man artistic talents that we see nowhere else in the animal kingdom. God gave us this as a gift to enjoy, to be able to take food and, and, and put a little hot and a little sweet together and, and make part of the dish hot and part of the dish cold and, and, and different textures. Gave us a tongue that can appreciate texture and taste and, and bitter and sour and sweet and hot and spicy. This is the gift of God. And for God to give us the ability, the the sense of touch and feeling. You know, the other day we were, I was talking with one of my daughters and they they already have come to the observation that if you give yourself a foot massage, it doesn't feel as good as somebody else does it. Have you noticed that? Someone else rubs your foot, that feels good. You doing the same movements, it somehow doesn't have the same effect. God gave us this gift to be able to appreciate the gift of touch, to feel. You notice... Side note, when Jesus healed the leper, he didn't speak to them and say, be clean. Do you notice how it says specifically, and he touched them and made them clean? See, nobody else would do that. Because they would be feared, they would fear that the, the, uh, the touch would make them unclean. And it would, possibly. You touch a germ, the germ doesn't get clean, you become dirty. You touch a, a dirty pig, the pig doesn't become clean, you become the dirty pig, right? Or like the dirty pig. But when Jesus, the impeccable Lamb of God, healed a leper, what does He do? And He touched them and cleansed them. Why? Because there's that longing in the heart for human touch. He's not just healing the body, He's healing the soul. Because God designed us to hug each other, to have people that we could embrace and hug and and feel and cuddle up with. And that's God's design. Beauty is God's design. It's not a sin to be beautiful. How many times does the Bible tell us that, that David was a ruddy young man and handsome to look at and, and Absalom was handsome to look at and Rebecca was beautiful and Rachel was beautiful and all these comments about people being physically beauty. That was God's idea. And none of us are equally gifted. Some people are more attractive than others. And if you are attractive, uh, well, enjoy it because you know what? Time goes on and things change. 
right? But it's not a sin. It's not, it's not a sin to notice that a particular man or a particular woman is handsome and good to look at. Not a sin to notice. Bible never says, men, thou shalt not notice that a, a girl is uh, a pretty and of good form. Never says such a thing. But you notice with all of these gifts, with all of these appetites and all of these things, there is a proper place for it. And then there is a violation of the boundary. There is a way that God says, okay, this is my gift, but, but with this gift come certain qualifications. With this gift of intimacy, I'm telling you that it has to be kept within marriage. And if it's not, it's going to get really ugly and really, and really dangerous. Amen. Heard about a man recently on the news, made public news, right over there in Lindenwood University. And he and other lawbreakers have been exposed to the HIV virus because they don't understand who God is or his God-given boundaries, and that God is infinitely wise and infinitely smart, if you will, and knew exactly what he was doing when he said that thou shalt not. But you see how Satan does it? Satan took a God-given thing and a God-given appetite, and he uses logic to appeal to the appetites because he knows that reason wins when it appeals to the desires that are existent. You see, one reason why atheists don't believe in God, or the main reason atheists do not believe in God is because the idea that there is no God appeals to their desire to be gods themselves, to be the creators of their own destiny. And, and to think, if, well, if there is a God, that means I can't sleep with whoever I want. And if there is a God, then there's a limit to my binge drinking. If there is a God, then I, I, I am guilty and I've got to face God, and He may send me to hell. I'd rather believe there is no God. See, they can reason and reason and reason with such eloquence, and it's foolishness. They're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness because they've chosen to believe a lie, Romans 1 tells us, because they want to justify themselves. Now, Satan, we're talking taking it off the atheists and putting it back on us. You have to beware, reasoning is a tool that God gave us. And it enables us to build buildings and bridges and, and write poetry and good books and think through problems. You don't see the animals doing that. Reason is itself a gift of God. But Satan will use reason and God-given appetites, and he knows how to use that reasoning to appeal to your appetites so that you will choose to believe a lie. And that is why we have to be very equipped in the Scripture. So what, what Satan is doing here is he's appealing to God-given appetites, but he's directing it with his reason, with his logic, to a forbidden thing that Eve knows is forbidden. And more importantly, Adam knows is forbidden. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 4 here and look at what comes next. So we already know uh, Adam is in the garden, Jesus is in the wilderness, Adam is full, Jesus is hungry. Look what happens in verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, is it a sin to eat bread? Will Jesus ever miraculously make bread in his ministry? Yes. Oh, yeah. He'll feed the thousands. What's the big issue here? Why couldn't he say, well, that doesn't sound too bad. You know, and anyway, if I ask for it and God gives it to me, it must be the will of God, right? That's not a very good test. You remember when God tells Moses, he tells Moses, Moses, the people are murmuring and tempting the Lord God at Meribah. They're, they're hungry, they're thirsty, and they're testing God, they're tempting God. And, and God tells Moses, says, okay, fine, Moses, go and speak to the rock. Last time I had you strike it, this time I want you to speak to the rock. And when you speak to the rock, the rock will bring forth water. Moses is angry. Moses is impatient. Who can blame Moses? I mean, Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. And yet, at this point, what does he do? In his wrath, in his anger, instead of speaking to the rock, just a small deviation, he strikes it. So he disobeyed God, but get this, God still caused water to come out of the rock. 
God didn't tell him to strike the rock. He told him to speak to the rock. He honored Moses before the people, but he goes on and tells Moses, he says, you know what, you didn't honor me before God. And as a result, you will not enter into the promised land. You will die. Where? In the wilderness. Where's Jesus? He's in the wilderness. Moses failed. Jesus prevailed. You know, you could rationalize it. I'm just striking the rock. If I didn't want to do it, he won't do it. You know, if it doesn't work the first time with the strike, well, then maybe I'll speak to the rock. That didn't work. Didn't get the formula right. I'll speak to the rock. And by the way, Paul tells us that rock is Christ. How many times was Christ crucified? Once. You don't crucify Christ afresh. You speak to Christ. Christ will never die. There's a song out there that's something about, um, you know, I love you so much, I I do it all over again. No, no. Christ was crucified once. That's it. Crucified once, we speak to Christ, we ask Christ, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, on the basis of Christ. And God says, Amen. But we don't strike the Christ a second time. We don't ask Jesus to die a second time. So Moses didn't make it. He died in the wilderness. But Jesus, where Moses failed, Christ prevailed. And so we know that the Spirit has led him into the wilderness, and he's led him there to fast. And the Spirit hadn't told Moses, Your fast is over. I said, Moses, Jesus. The Spirit hadn't told Jesus, your fast is over. So for him to say, let these stones be made into bread in order to demonstrate to Satan, ha ha, see, I really am the Son of God. Second of all, what would he have been doing? If he had had done that, what would he be discounting? What would he be questioning? What's the last thing we read in chapter 3? In the the baptism? This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. For Jesus to to acquiesce to the request of Satan would have been to say, you know, I'm not sure of my sonship. I'm not sure if I really am the son of God. But to prove it to you and prove it to me, I'll turn the stones into bread. That would have been tempting the Lord God. And so look at what he, look at the response of Jesus. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's in Deuteronomy 8, 3. And again, the context is, is so interesting that I've got to read to you Deuteronomy 8, but not just verse 3. I, I want to go back a little bit earlier. I want to go back to 8, 2. It says, And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you into the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. The context is what? I brought you into the wilderness. I let you be hungry to teach you that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God now I've been thinking about that phrase man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God what does it really mean well I do see in this verse secondarily an admonition to study the word of God Memorize the Word of God. Meditate upon the Word of God so that it becomes part of us so that we are able to resist the devil the same way Jesus did by saying it is written. There is value there. But I think there's something else that we need to recognize. That God is sovereign. You live by divine decree. If it's God's will that you be struggling financially... It's God's will. If it's God's will that you're going through a test, it's God's will. And part of it is recognizing that God decrees my destiny. God is in the driver's seat. I am the subordinate. He is in control. I will rejoice in the good gifts He gives me. I may ask for Him to relieve me of my afflictions. We can do that. Uh, We can pray. We can pray in faith. We can believe for miracles. But we need to understand that God is in control. He is sovereign. Man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And when God ordains we die, we die. But we're not to fear those that can destroy the body, but rather we're to fear God who can throw body and soul into hell. We're to acknowledge His sovereignty. And what He's basically saying to Satan is He says, you know what, God wants me to fast, I'm going to fast. And it's better that I obey God than I listen to you. Because my belly is not my God. God. God is my God. 
and I live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now that secondary one about how we're to live off the word of God as the bread of life. Uh, there's other scriptures like in John 6 that teach this when Jesus said, it is the spirit that makes a life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And even here, the pattern is what? Jesus doesn't say, Satan, do you know who I am? I created you, you little pipsqueak. When you're a twinkling in my eye, I remember. All things were made by me, and without me, nothing was made that was made. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus faces the temptation the same way he expects you to. And he shows us a pattern that by quoting Scripture accurately, he is able to refute the twistings and the lies of the devil. So is there an exhortation? Is there a practical application that we should devour the Word of God and meditate upon the Word of God? Well, yes, there is. And Deuteronomy 6 tells us, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall speak of them when you sit in your house. Not just in the church. Not just in the Sunday school. You're to speak of them when you walk along the way, when you sit in your house, when you rise up, when you come in, when you go out. It's to become part of you. It's to become the very foundation of your faith and your foundation of your reason and the, the foundation of logic. We're to reason from the Scriptures. We're to approach life's problems and ailments with the presupposition God's word is true. Every jot and every tittle. Heaven and earth will pass away. Uh, Dawkins will pass away. All the reasoning of the atheists will pass away. But my words will never pass away. You can bank on it. And you can send it on to heaven ahead because his word is true. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let's read on here. Temptation number two. And then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest in any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, I, I want to... I want to tell you what I don't know about this passage. This passage interest, raises very interesting questions that I don't know the answer to. And I'm going to tell you just because it's kind of interesting anyway. Uh, I don't need to be ashamed of the fact that I don't understand everything. What God's Word is inexhaustible. And, and maybe one day I'll, I'll fully understand this and have a more clear view of this. But I, I don't know, is Jesus in His body or out of His body when He does this? I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting that here he's taken to the pinnacle of the temple and, and another pa- and then later on he's taken up into an exceedingly high mountain. Uh, was this some kind of out-of-body experience or was he translated there like Philip was in the book of Acts? I, I don't know. Not, not sure. But in any case, uh, let's just take for a second, let's take the, the, one, the one route just to make a point with it. It's possible, at least from my standpoint, that in his spirit he's taken up to the pinnacle of the temple. But at that moment, the choice is a real choice. Cast yourself down from here. Put God to the test. See if God really is with you. It's possible that it was done in the spirit. And the reason it I, I occurred to me, I don't have dreams very often. Last night I had a dream. It was just a dream, nothing spiritual about it. But I had a dream, and it just occurred to me as I woke up that in the dream world, I'm making choices and doing things that in the waking world could never be made. And yet, still, sin can happen in a dream. Sometimes it's very illogical in a dream, but there's something about that dream world. I've often found that Satan comes and tests and tempts and, and does things. That's why it's good to meditate upon the Word of God even in your bed, like, like Psalm 4 says. Um, how, how was this done? Was he physically taken there or, or in it? But in any case, the volitional choice to obey or disobey God was real. And to disobey God and give in to Satan's proddings would have been to test the Lord. Now, how did, how did that serpent speak to Eve? Was it in an audible voice? Or was there some mind reading going on? I'm not sure, but I know this. I know Satan will speak to your spirit. Satan will speak to your mind. When Peter, later on, 
in Matthew 16. And he says, Jesus, don't go to the cross. You don't need to go to the cross. You don't have to. You can avoid the cross. You can go back to the temple. And you can jump off the pinnacle. And everybody will see your Messiah. And they'll believe on you the shortcut way. That's essentially what he's doing here. And what does Jesus say to, say, to, to, put, to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. Because in essence, the exact same temptation is here. You see, if Jesus casts himself off the pinnacle, whether this is in reality in the physical or not, if everybody sees them jump off and the angels bear him up, what would everybody do? <gasps> That's God coming down out of heaven. No cross, shortcut to glory, kingdoms of the world right now, here it is. Same thing with the, the making stones into bread. You remember later on, whenever he started making bread for the people, what do the people immediately say? They don't say crucify him. What do they say? Let's make him a king. If Jesus had the power to turn stones into bread and all he did all the time was run a soup kitchen and no time the world would pave their way to Jesus. Wow. Roman army would say, man, we could feed an army for conquest all over the globe if we could have this guy making turning stones into bread. We'll make him leader and he can feed the army everywhere they go. We'll be unbeatable. The world would say, wow, this guy can solve all the poverty problems of the world. He can solve it right now. Let's make him the head of the world. Shortcut to glory. Same thing. Cast yourself down from the temple. Everybody will see it. They'll know you're God. Shortcut to glory. What's Jesus' response here? He says in verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now that is from uh, Deuteronomy 6.16. Now what's the temptation here? Well, uh, as also to add a little application, I believe that Jesus, that Satan is tempting Jesus to manipulate God into doing his bidding. He'll just manipulate him. Satan is a manipulator. And he wants Jesus to be a manipulator. You know, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. It is written. You can tell him, God, you have to, you have to bear me up because in Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, you said, he shall give his angels a charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You can quote scripture to God and force his hand into bearing you up. You can be, use scripture to manipulate God. One problem I have, one of the many I have with a lot of the prosperity movement is, is people think they found a formula to manipulate God. You quote the right scripture, you say it in the right way, you spend enough time doing whatever, and you can manipulate God by throwing scripture in God's face, and you can make Him give you what you want, so you can use Jesus as a means for getting all the possessions of this world and everything else. Something that the Bible says, they that will seek after will pierce themselves through with many, sorrow, many sorrows and hurtful lusts. Well, here... Here is Satan tempting Jesus to tempt God, manipulate God, and say, God, you have to, you have to bear me up because you said so. It's manipulation. It's guilt manipulation. Now, I don't know. I, I think once in a while, you'll see this too, even mature Christians will fall into the trap of trying to manipulate God. Trying to manipulate God into giving them what they want. But more often, you see it in those under authority for those over authority. See, those over authority... They just, they dictate or scream a little louder, whatever. But the trick of those under authority is manipulation, right? Guilt manipulation. But you said, but she got that last time, but he got that last time. All these guilt manipulations. And, and wives do it to husbands and children do it to parents and, and husbands do it to wives. And we have a lot of manipulation going on. But manipulation is not the way of the master. It's the way of disaster. I said it more because it rhymes than it makes sense. But anyway, here, here he is, and what does he quote? He says, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, what's the context? This is the context. Going back to, um, he's, he's reminding them of their temptation of the wilderness, and he says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you did at Mesa. The same time Moses fell, what was the Israel doing in the wilderness? Is it God? Have you brought us out of Egypt to kill us in this wilderness? Lord, uh, do you really, are you really going to keep your word? You said you were going to bring us into a promised land, but all we've got is a wilderness where there's nothing to drink, there's nothing to eat. They're accusing God of child abuse. They're accusing God of, of breaking his word. You said you were going to bring us to the promised land, and here we are in this wilderness. And basically, devil's doing the same thing. He's saying, 
Are you really the son of God? Did God really mean it? Hath God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased? And Jesus said, you know what? I'm not going to tempt the Lord my God. I think interesting enough, it's almost a pun because what is Satan doing? He's tempting his creator. He's tempting the Lord his God right now. The creator of Lucifer himself. And Lucifer's acting like he is on par with the Most High and he has the power to to give him at his bidding. Now let's look at verses 8, starting in verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now that's interesting. I I was thinking about how you don't really see some of the sexual temptations in this temptation. But what you do see here is you see Satan saying, all the world, all of his glory, all of the kingdoms, it can all be yours if you'll worship me. If you'll worship me. There's an interesting line in the Anglican prayer book don't exactly know what I think about it, but it's kind of an interesting line. And, and, and it's done in weddings. At weddings, peop, the, the, they'll say, and I with my body, I thee worship. Puritans had a real problem with that. They didn't like that. But um, some of King James' men, I think King James himself said, well, wait a minute here. Aren't, you know, basically breaking it down to this, what is worship? Worship is ascribing worth and value to something. And, and when in those times of intimacy a person is saying, I accept you, I value you, I desire you, I find worth in you, and that's a very satisfying thing. What is Satan doing? He's saying, worship me. Give me the worship I long for. And the payment of your prostituting yourself before me will be the kingdoms of this world. Satan's asking Jesus to be a prostitute. He's asking him to play the whore. That's what he's doing. And what's it called? What is he, how does he reply, reply to him? With the first and second commandment. And what is it called throughout the Old Testament when someone violates the second commandment? It's called playing the whore. Idolatry yeah. is whoredom. It's spiritual adultery. And what's Satan doing? He's saying, be an adulterer. Worship me and I will pay you the kingdoms of this world. I'll give you the world, just give me your worship. And what he's saying is, he's saying, I've got eyes only for the Lord. Him only shall I serve. Him only shall I serve. And so what we see here, we see three temptations. We see, uh, in one sense, it does, it's not an exact correlation, but the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Satan uses logic and reasoning and even the scripture, twisting it, in order to appeal to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Conclusion. I'm going to bring it down to us. How do we resist Satan? Jesus resisted Satan in a way that was meant to be emulated. So what advice can we take from this, or what principles can we take of it? Well, first of all, I want to point out that we must recognize the tempter's voice. Eve apparently did not recognize that this was not just uh, a serpent of the reptilian family. She didn't recognize that this subtle beast was the voice of Satan. But Jesus was able to recognize Satan when Satan spoke. He knew the voice of God, he knew his voice, and he knew the voice of Satan. There was a real wake-up call for me in Bible school when God taught me that dreams and things that were happening in the night, you know, I was thinking it's what I ate for dinner, and it was not. It was a satanic attack, and I learned to identify that. Very important, we learned to identify it. When, when, When Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, he recognized that Satan was using Peter just as he had used the serpent. He knew the enemy's voice and he knew the voice of the father and jesus said my sheep know my voice how do you learn god's voice well we can repeat this point over and over again you get in his word and you learn his voice 
you pray and you seek Him and you learn His voice. And God will train you. You know, there'll be times where you, you, know, you feel something prodding you to do something and, and uh, you don't do it. And then later you realize, wow, I missed out a blessing. That really was the voice of God. Or I didn't do it and a penalty came. That really was the voice of God. God trains us. His sheep learn His voice like a child learns the voice of their parent. You walk with Christ. You commune with Christ. You spend time with Christ. You pray as you go along the way. You start to learn His voice. Second principle. We need to understand His tricks and His devices. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, In order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. You need to recognize how Satan uses reason and logic, but he'll appeal to your lusts, your desire, your appetites, your pride, and he will use logic, he'll use rationalization by appealing to your sin nature or even your God-given appetites. We see him doing that to Adam and Eve. We see him doing that to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And we see him trying to do that to Jesus. It was a legitimate appetite to desire bread, especially after 40 days he was hungry. But Jesus knew the voice of the tempter and he knew the voice of the spirit. And he said, no, man will not live by bread alone, but I'm going to live by doing the will of God. I live by obedience. And we live by his obedience. Third, we need to recognize that Satan also uses Scripture. Hath God said, it is written. Is it not written? Cast yourself down from here, and the angels shall bear thee up. We must be good at hermeneutics. That is the rules of interpretation. We need to be mighty in the Scriptures. We need to learn to reason in the Scriptures. We have to be able to evaluate when we hear some some big highfalutin... uh, um, scholar come along and cast doubt on the word of God we need to understand their belly is speaking you see God gave you a belly God gave you a brain God gave you a heart God gave you a mouth God gave you ears and there's a a, a important correlation in all those areas be careful what you hear be careful what you speak be careful what you believe be careful what you desire Satan will use God-given appetites And he will use his logic to twist them in order to get us to disobey God. The way that Jesus deals with Satan is by saying, It is written, it is written, it is written. If you don't hear, you don't know it. You know what? Ignorance is bliss until you get the bill. Ignorance is bliss until you get the bill. You know what? You don't get wisdom. You might get wisdom afterwards, but you sure wish you had it ahead of time, right? You know, wisdom demands payment up front. Wisdom costs self-denial of the flesh now for reward later. Ignorance says, hey, if I don't know, I'm not accountable. Well, you know what? The person, person may have started smoking, not knowing the effects of smoking, but now that you got emphysema, you wish you'd have known when you were in your 20s, right? I mean, you may have been ignorant of the effects of certain foods and the effect that they have and and not knowing about pesticides. You ate that food. You know what? If if I eat anything with aspartame in it, I get a terrible, terrible headache. And my ignorance doesn't change the fact that I get a headache from aspartame. There may have been no intent. I didn't know know that that cookie had aspartame in it and I ate the cookie or whatever it was, the diet, whatever, and totally ignorant of what was in it. Years ago, I was getting terrible headaches. I was eating yogurt every day. It's supposed to be healthy, fat-free yogurt. And I'm getting these terrible headaches and I overhear a guy talking about the effects of aspartame. And I don't know why I'm having these terrible headaches. I'm thinking, I've got a tumor. Every day I bend over, I pick up, and I get this headache that's ready to throw me to the floor, and I don't know why. It's a terrible, piercing headache. And then God ordained that someone would speak about it, and I said, you know what? I think that's what it is. I quit eating those yogurts, I quit eating aspartame, and I quit having the headaches. Anytime I have aspartame, I get headaches. Now the point is, is that, you know what? Ignorance may be bliss until you get the headache, until you get the bill. But wisdom demands seeking and searching, diligently finding out. Now, a lot of people said, oh, you know, it'll be okay. God saved me, and it's all going to work out in the end. He's going to work all things together for good to those that love God that are called according to His purpose. And I don't need to study, and I don't need to learn. I don't need to meditate. You're going to have all kinds of consequences in life that you could have avoided if you had diligently sought after wisdom. 
And all you're getting, get understanding. Get wisdom about eating. Get wisdom about money. Get wisdom about relationships. Get wisdom, young people, about child training before you need it. Because if you get it when they're 14 and you say, man, I wish I'd have known this when they were three years old. Well, ignorance, it was bliss at the moment, right? You think? But the bill, the consequences, is terrible. So take advantage of the fact that you have opportunity to get wisdom ahead of time. Mine the scriptures for truth. Proverbs 3 says that we're to, we're to search it like someone searches for a hidden treasure, like a miner mines for gold. We're to seek after wisdom and understanding because how profitable a life you live. How much you glorify God for eternity. Whether you have crowns to throw at His feet, part of it is getting wisdom and getting understanding so that you can say to the devil, It is written. 1 John 2, 12 to 17, good one to write down, good one to memorize. It says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. You're a little child, you just came to faith, you don't have much wisdom. Hey, good news, your sins are forgiven you. Big number one issue is taken care of. I am writing to you, fathers, because you have known him. God wants you to know him, grow in maturity, grow in wisdom, grow in relationship. Because you have known him, who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young Men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who, was from the, who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. There it says it again. How do we overcome the evil one? He says in verse 15, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that is your appetites, and the lust of the eyes, all those pretty things, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world passeth away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. The things you do that are done in the will of God are gold and silver, and they will abide forever. But the things you do that are not... You know, the person can be saved, 1 Corinthians 3, but their works are going to burn because they did all these things that weren't done according to the will of God, and therefore it will not abide forever. We are to identify the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. We're to recognize them. We're to know what is being appealed to. Ask yourself when you hear some new doctrine or some new teaching or some new philosophy and say, okay, what does this appeal to at this moment? My desire for truth and to know God or my belly or my brain or my eye. Is my belly being appealed to? Is it my appetites? Or is it my eye, my desire for pretty things? Or is it my intellect and the boastful pride of life, that feeling of arrogance? You ever notice how arrogant and angry the atheist is, the intellectual atheist? Arrogant, angry, bitter individuals. Well, it comes with the territory. There's a lot of scriptures I could read about temptation. I'll just read, finish with one. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted. Beyond that, you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. You know, all temptations can really be summed up in a temptation of idolatry. In the garden, when Satan said, you shall be as gods, that was the first temptation to idolatry. All the temptations of Satan, are they not a temptation to to put God in second place and to take the position of first? When Satan fell, was it not when he said, I shall ascend to the place of the Most High? I'm going to be above the stars, equal to God? And so we're told that in, in essence, the essence of all temptation is to prioritize the lust of the flesh given by God maybe or or the desire for wisdom given by God. An appetite or something pretty 
exalted above the giver of the good gift. But if you will eat God's word, stay close to the shepherd, and hear his voice, there is a way of escape out of all the temptations. So let us remember that Christ flawlessly prevailed where all others failed, first of all. And second of all, let us remember that he has shown us a pattern of how we are to deal with the tempter when he comes to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us the pattern. You have given us your word so that we are not ignorant of the enemy's schemes and devices. Lord, I pray that you would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because, Father, we are feeble and we are dependent upon you. We are no match for him. But one little word shall fell him from Jehovah Tzavayot, from Yahweh Tzavayot. On earth there is none Satan's equal, but in Jesus Christ. A mighty fortress is our God. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom. Give our children wisdom. Oh, the youthful lusts that pull, the desires of the world that pull at us. But you've ordained that even children should overcome the world, overcome the wicked one. And so, God, I pray that you would make the young people in this church, the children in this church, all of us really, that you would make us mighty in spirit, able to see the devices of Satan so that we can live out our lives in wisdom and understanding, full of the spirit and power, and come before your throne with crowns to throw at your feet. Because we're totally dependent upon you, Lord. In our flesh dwells no good thing, but you give the spirit without measure. And we depend upon Him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.